Oh, this is going to be a cool panel. I'm excited to bring on Dr. Nicole Calhoun. She's not like graduated as a doctor, but she is like a plant doctor. She is a good friend. She is co-founder and co-owner of Artemisia Nursery in Northeast LA. Uh, she's the bass player for an amazing band called Sage Against the Machine. Um, and Dr. Evan Meyer, who is almost a research doctor, but he is the, um, he's, <laughs> he's, he's the amazing vocalist and pianist for the same band, but he's executive director now for Theodore Payne Foundation, which, correct me if I'm wrong, Evan, Theodore Payne Foundation is the oldest still running native plant nursery in California? Um, if you if you take the time that Theodore Payne himself started the the his business, which was in 1902, then yeah, I would say so. We've been around since 1960s, so, you know, like California Botanic Garden might be in the running on that too, but um, we've been around for a while. Yeah, Theodore Payne, the man, came in the early 1900s and started selling native plants back then. I love it. How are you doing, Nicole? Doing great. How are you guys? It's good. This is just like like band practice. We're just hanging out, <laughs> except there's 463 people watching. I can't believe <laughs> we've kept it this many people. It's amazing. So I asked Nicole and Evan to join me on this panel to talk about design ideas and where to put native milkweed in your garden, how to use it, what type of irrigation techniques you might use, what plants it grows around, lots of different things. So we have some general ideas that we wanna talk about. And we were looking for folks to give us uh, through the chat and Q and A questions about, you know, I tried to grow it here and it died. Um, I, I have a whole front lawn in Pasadena, where should I put it? Or, you know, I remove a lawn. So Izzy, if you could do us a favor and monitor those, uh, those topics. But I just want to start off with this picture I took the other day um, in one of our gardens, our public gardens here at the, the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. This is at King Gillette Ranch. King Gillette Ranch is, is in Calabasas. It's hot. It'll be 105 degrees there, you know, uh, some days during the summer. And a friend of ours, a coworker, planted, I think he said about five or 10 plants of milkweed about two or three years ago. And those plants from what I remember him saying aren't there anymore, but they've bounced around. And one of the places that they bounced around is right by these irrigation, these valve boxes. And I don't know if this means that they're leaking or <laughs> because they do like water sometimes, or they, they, they love extra water. Um, or if they're just finding these little corners that we'll find sometimes when concrete meets, meets the dirt, right? The concrete ends, the sidewalk ends, and the dirt begins. There's little dips and there's little divots. And those are perfect places for water to gather, for seed to hang on. If you guys have ever driven in the desert, you know, past Riverside, going out to Phoenix, you'll see that five, 10 feet away from the I-10 is lush. It's so dang lush. And then you look 30 feet away and it's dry. The same exact plants are in two different conditions right the the road will attract water there's a river sometimes by the road when it rains it kind of washes off the road and so all these little micro habitats and microclimates in gardens i think are super important for when we're thinking about where we're going to put milkweed so i wanted to, photo, to Tonio, we can't see it yet yeah the the uh people are clamoring for this photo oh you can't oh, can you not they see, it? see it yeah the chat oh, is like see. where's the photo come on let's see <laughs> where is my everyone's <laughs> super excited for this photo <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a bad, it's not even a good photo. Can you see? Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, yep. It's coming right up on the irrigation boxes. Yep. Um, there we go. Can yeah, I so say something just to great. like frame, frame some quick thoughts on this? Because I've been sure. thinking about this this morning. So first off, I want to like plug a book. It was kind of a cool book, Planting in a Post-Wild World. Um, and so we're talking about design, right? Like, for me, I think my take on this is that milkweeds are definitely best. The native milkweeds are definitely best in a naturalistic kind of planting, like a meadow planting or the kind of type of plantings that are kind of becoming like the new modern style, which is um, like sometimes they call it the new perennial style that Pete Udoff has made famous um, or the new American garden style. Um, and that's where I think they really work. So I think we could maybe explore that a little bit. Um, like, 
those mixed perennial meadow gardens, which to me are so much more beautiful than a more formal garden. And I don't really, I don't, I can't imagine, I've never seen this, but I can't really imagine our native milkweeds in a super formal layout. I'm curious if you guys have ever seen that or think that would work. I've yet to see it. I would love to see someone try. <laughs> Yeah, and I would, uh, I, I would agree with Evan. If you plant an oak tree, <laughs> you don't really want that oak tree jumping around your garden. You don't want it to be like, oh, it's going to provide shade for my house during the summer. Cool. And you don't want it to end up like in your backyard. Um, same thing with like a ceanothus or a manzanita or something that you want five by five for full color right in front of your house during the summer. But milkweed, I, it, 100%, Evan, it's... Um, it's going to be happy where it's going to be happy. You might, uh, our goal, one of our goals here is to hopefully avoid you losing too many plants, but they do tend to like, almost like California fuchsia, they tend to get established and then kind of start to wander around the nursery, which makes them not the most convenient for like a white house, <laughs> Washington DC type lawn, right? For sure. Yeah. And I think, I think that's what you're seeing here with the irrigation boxes and there are ways of designing a garden to embrace that. And um, Nicole and Antonio, you've seen my yard and I, I let it go. I let it ramble. And I'm all, I, I think like, to me, that's the most interesting looking. You kind of get the most bang for your buck in terms of supporting wildlife. And it's also to me, the most like interesting thing to garden in because you're seeing, you're, you're like reacting to it. You're not just, you're not just establishing it and kind of like dominating your space. You're letting your space be in dialogue with you and, and like you're like yes. oh look at that there's a little seedling there I'm gonna let that one grow or like you know this this seedling here is not quite the right place I'm gonna pull that one out and so it's much more of a like an interaction versus like you're just imposing something and I think that's the way that you should probably think about gardening with these plants is, is like you, they're gonna tell you what what they want more so than you're gonna tell them probably yes so I'm going to cover two real quick topics. And then, Nicole, I'm going to let you freestyle. Um, we always, Theodore Payne, I'm sure it says it, Artemisia Nursery says it, that the best time to plant, the ideal time to plant is November to March or somewhere in that area, right? What we call the rainy season or the cool season. <laughs> Throw that out the window for what we're talking about now, which is milkweed. And it's kind of weird because people are like, oh, I got to plant November to March. So throw it out the window. And the other thing I'd like to emphasize is that if you can afford it, which is why accessibility is so important, if you can afford it, try to get more than two plants, more than three plants. We want to establish colonies of these plants, especially if you have monarchs around, they'll, they'll decimate one plant. So ideally, you'll buy small pots, you'll plant March, April, May, and you'll be planting groups of threes, fives, sevens, right? So, Nicole? Yeah, so... Um over here in Northeast LA, a lot of folks in our community uh, have been lucky enough to take advantage of the DWP turf replacement rebate. Uh, that's our local water district. And um, one of the things they've been emphasizing besides using California friendly plants or mostly California native plants is to incorporate rainwater capture, um, including like rain gardens. So like a shallow basin in your soil where water collects and that ties right back into what Antonio was describing about seeing the milkweed popping up in these places where water tends to collect. Um, milkweed's a great, great plant. If you're, if you're lucky enough to take advantage of this rebate, um, get, get some milkweed in your rain garden. Um, even if you're not doing the rebate, think about like ways that you can be collecting rainwater in your garden just by subtly shifting the topography of the soil and uh, look at those low lying places as, as home for milkweed. Um, but then as we are talking about, you know, it's dormant half the year, it's getting munched on by caterpillars half the year. Um, it's maybe like wandering around the yard. And so, you know, if we only have milkweed there, aesthetically, maybe that's not fulfilling all of our garden fantasies. And then also as far as our monarchs, they, they need nectar year round. So um, we wanna also incorporate plants that are providing beautiful blooms aesthetically and providing forage for the monarchs. So I think that's something the three of us could all talk to is like, combinations of plants that really like to nestle the milkweed, the groupings of milkweed in between um, plants that are going to provide more year round structure and bloom. Um, so I don't know if you guys want to start throwing down some favorites for that, especially for like maybe beginning gardeners, plants that are a little easier. Um, I'll throw down one right away. That's just like 
a giver right off right out the gate is in Celia Californica. They grow so fast. If you're starting with a blank slate, you don't know what to do, and you want to provide habitat, throw some Encelia Californica in there. It's going to grow to like four feet in the first year. It's going to be covered in flowers for months on end, uh, provide habitat not only for, for monarchs, but lots of other insects and songbirds as well when it goes to seed. Um, so that's a really fun one to, you know, get in the mix. Yeah. of foods. I agree with that one. And also that's one that can tend to like spread around a little bit too. So if you're creating that like ecosystem garden where you're letting things move and speak to you, that's a great choice in Celia Californica. I'm going to throw out yarrow. If you're yeah. particularly if you're going for like a meadow type planting, um, because it can take a little extra water. If you want to kind of push your milkweed with water, you can do that. Um, the other thing that just, I don't think we've gotten to, and I'm, I'm sorry, it's my daughter's fifth birthday, so it's very hectic here. So I miss the, oh, uh, hey, the morning. Evan, is, she, is Violet there? She's somewhere. She's running around with her friend. Yeah. We're getting ready for 15 kids to show up at her house. Dude, That's you got to call her. It's it's <laughs> so cool that you took time out of it. We, let's sing happy birthday to her real quick. Whenever, <laughs> we, we, have 400, we have 450 to, people to sing happy birthday. 100%. Um, dude, we got to. Yeah. But the other thing I would just, I'm sure someone has already mentioned this, but they're kind of slow like you kind of have to get them through some time. They don't like milkweeds themselves. They're not just going to be like blooming right off the bat. In my experiences, you, you kind of have to like get some time for them to establish and become a full plant. Um, so, so that's part of something to incorporate into like design ideas is that it's, you know, you, you got to be ready to, to kind of wait a year or two for it to, to grow to, to the size, to full size and to flower as well. Yeah, and think of it too, you're not just cultivating the top of the plant, you're really cultivating like that root system that's going to come back for you each year. So there's a lot of a lot of action going on under the ground that we're not seeing and you have to have a little faith in that as a gardener. Yeah, I agree. So there's this, um, it, most native plants like Encelia Californica, the one you guys just mentioned, yarrow, those are fast. Those are almost like weeds. And yeah. then there's a small group of native plants that were like, they're going to take a few years to get established. I think the most common one is Matilla hot poppy that people are like, you plant it, you know, handle the roots gently, delicately, you plant it. It might not do anything for a year or two, but once it takes hold, watch out. That thing is, is gone. Oh, and it's, I think it's and aggressive. Think it's, yeah. Because of, um, dude, it's more aggressive than my cousin on payday <laughs> at a bar, dude, at a singles bar. That thing is aggressive, <laughs> <laughs> but not, my cousin aside, um, so, you know, we see patterns as horticulturists and, uh, Romnia, which is metal poppy. I see the same thing with hummingbird sage when people plant hummingbird sage. And so Romnia, let, let me go back to metal poppy. Metal poppy grows underground. It spreads underground. It wants to create this colony. Uh, hummingbird sage does the same thing. It wants to grow underground and spread and create this colony. And people want flowers the first year on hummingbird sage. And I always tell them, cut back the first or second round of flowers you see because what that does is it pushes the plant down. It signals, not time to have babies yet. Let's keep growing sideways. And you'd be amazed at how quickly you can get a full colony of, of hummingbird sage by just sacrificing that first year of flowers. And the same thing with milkweed. I'm not telling you to cut your milkweed down your first year. It probably won't even flower the first year. But what you're seeing the first year, sometimes the second is underground growth that you can't see unless you have like amazing like X-Men glasses to see through the ground. You see there's a bunch of, roots getting established once year two or three come out it has a strong foundation and those things take off so yes being patient with with narrow leaf milkweed is super important um that that thing about like cutting your plant that's something that i think separates like uh, a really experienced gardener and someone who's just starting out is when you're just starting out and you're growing a plant and you've like put all this love into it. Oh, every leaf is precious. Every leaf is precious. And then like some like, you know, you know, old jaded gardener, like, like maybe like some of us um, comes and just rips the top off it and like, all right, I fixed it for you. And you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> or they come in and they, they coppice it, they cut it to the ground. You're like, what are you doing? That was my plan. It's so beautiful. But that's really how you get that super nice lush look is oh, you guys remember that that hummingbird sage incident at my old apartment right i had this beautiful hummingbird oh. sage and i was like nurturing it and uh the landlord brought in you know mow and blow crew and they they just like decimated it took it all the way down like you couldn't see anything left of it i was just like oh my baby and 
<laughs> it's only sprouted back like 10 times fuller than it was before. And I was like, oh, what a miracle it made it through that, you know? And then like three months later, Mo and Goku comes back and I'm like trying to tell them like, don't, don't take this one out. But sure enough, it just got like decimated again, like all the way to the ground. And then it's like 10 times bigger when it comes back. It was really amazing. So, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but you know, as long as it, as many years as you've been in doing this business, like it can still be scary. Like we have a, um, a Panamint Daisy at, at Theodore Payne and it's, it's a really rare Daisy and Celiopsis covilii. Um, it's the emblem of the California Native Plant Society. And we've got like six of them in pots. And so they're like precious to us. And and Tim Becker and I always go and look at them and he's our director of horticulture. And there's like a bunch of buds on the base of them. And there's like the top has leaves. And we're like, normally you'd be like, all right, cool. You can just cut the top off and let the base sprout out and get and the plant will get bigger. And with that one, we're like, every time we go look at it, we're like, should we cut the top off? I don't know. Like, this is so rare. We're we going to kill it. So, you know, even if you're, even if you're experienced, there's always something to learn. And, and it is like kind of scary to just cut a plant back like that, but, but it's a good thing to do for many of them. I yeah. don't think it's a good thing to do for milkweed though, unless I'm wrong. Do you... Oh yeah. I don't, I wouldn't recommend that. I was just saying how it's, it grows by rhizome and a lot of the, the action people were commenting earlier that I've had a milkweed in for almost two years. It hasn't flowered. Um, it's not, you know, it's not growing or it's basically that was it. Um, and I think a lot of the problem is that you, it's working. It's doing its thing. It's just underground. We can't see it. I wanted to comment on um, the idea of using milkweed in a more, I don't know what the word is, naturalistic, wild uh, landscape. Um, <laughs> you guys remember the super blooms from a few years ago? Those were all, or most of them are annuals. So it rains, they bloom, and they're great. But And the LA Times covers them in March, but the LA Times never goes back in August because most of those are annuals and they're gone. There's skeletons there and really nothing else besides maybe some few shrubs that are just spaced out. And so I wanna encourage you guys um, and you guys can, can please chime in to stop using <laughs> annual wildflowers and I think go for more perennial wildflowers, stuff yeah. that even when the flowers aren't there, the plant is still there. And so you guys already threw at least one out, which was yarrow. And I think yarrow is a phenomenal plant for a wildland, naturalistic, like almost like a grassland, super bloom type tapestry. If you removed a lawn and wanted to combine about five different plants, yarrow would be perfect. Mine, Nicole, you said throw it down. Mine is coyote mint. And I don't get to say coyote oh. mint very much. Yeah, no, because, that's because where I work, we just do the local stuff from Santa Monica Mountains. But Monardella Viosa, like you can make wasn't some vato making like beer out of it or wasn't he making like uh wasn't he using it for like uh mojitos <laughs> Evan? I'm sure somebody is yeah i think somebody was yeah but anyway yeah. that that's such no, a that, that flower is so fat even i could sit on it and sip nectar i could pull a, a <laughs> straw out and sip on it i love um coyote mint so yarrow coyote mint milkweed in a mixed naturalistic landscape in your front yard you guys got any any other ones Oh yeah, I mean, we gotta call out some for like that late fall bloom, like uh, the bug Bob was talking about. So uh, I'd say like Solidago, California Goldenrod's a real nice one. That also works with that rain garden concept. You've got that lower lying space in your garden where water tends to collect. Solidago's great. It's gonna spend, send up those bloom spikes uh, like late in the summer, early fall with just hundreds of little golden flowers on them. Um, so that's, a, I think, important to think about that year round effect. And on the oh, other end of that, we could also, you know, if you're, if you're um, maybe a little bit more experienced or willing to kind of take the risk, you want to try growing some manzanita. Those guys bloom real early in the season and the monarchs like those flowers as well. Um, so you can make a nice little, little sandwich with your manzanita in the background, your milkweed in the middle some nice pretty flowers in the front, like your Encelia, the bush sunflower, and the Achillea, the yarrow. Get some nice layers yeah. going. Another really good um, aster species is the gum plant, Grindelia. Yeah. Um, really good nectar plant. It blooms a little later and it's, it's super um, easy. Like you can cut it back. I love plants that you can like forget to water them and they tell you and they don't just die. They like, you know that you messed up and then you get a second chance. Unlike a manzanita or a ceanothus, where if you screwed up, you're probably yeah. you're in trouble. Like, there's no going back on those. But, like, with, with some, some of the plants, like, I feel like Encelia is kind of like this, too. Like, 
it'll crinkle up and lose its leaves and you're like, oh crap. And then you, you water it, you know, and it comes right back. back. And the same with the gum plant. Is it the same yeah, gum plant's a really nice one. It really it hugs the ground. It looks great, like kind of at scale. I feel like it's a little bit of like, sometimes it's a hard sell in the pot. Like you look at it in the pot and you're like, oh yeah. But then you see it in a landscape and it's very striking, very aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, and then with that, like, Antonio talking about that perennial, like, which is kind of like the, the trend, it's the cool design thing, like popularized by like the, the Brooklyn High Line was like a thing that really made that a popular style, is that leaving, and this gets beyond just like being good for monarchs, but, but um, just aesthetically interesting, leaving stuff or appreciating like the form of the plant outside of just the flowers and the, the actual like, um, I think it's the filleries they're called technically of the gum plant are these little sticky, it's like this little sticky ball, spiky ball that's green. So if you get a whole mass of those going like interspersed with, with some milkweeds and some encelia and some yarrow, like it's just a cool like little textural feature to add. Yeah. I, I love the, the, the plant palette we just created. I want to show you guys uh, some, just these pictures right here. So this is uh, on the right, is the reseeding just establishing itself narrow leaf milkweed kind of skinnier leaf what we would expect to find in an unirrigated garden we water, water this garden twice a month in calabazas and then you can see the same exact garden on the left this almost looks like a like a cannabis plant these leaves yeah. are so big and so the difference is when plants find a little bit more water. And again, we're not watering any different, but the water hangs out longer in shade, right? Um, and it's not getting blasted as much by the sun. So they're both in flower or about to be in flower, but just the leaves are so much bigger. So we could make a case. I'm not sure that anyone's studied this, but to have slightly more irrigated milkweed and irrigated in or milkweed plants in less intense conditions. So not against a reflected heat wall. Maybe the conditions are nicer in our landscapes where there's a light shade and where there's a little bit more water and maybe that makes more leaves. And does that mean that there's more food for monarchs, right? Totally. Can I throw out one, one plant that's sort of outside of this whole meadow mixed perennial thing we're talking about, mm -hmm. which is a, actually a species of milkweed, um, the desert milkweed, Asclepia subulata. I don't know if anyone's talked about that, but I am a big believer in that plant because it's super drought tolerant I and it's really pretty. And that one is more structural and you could use it in a slightly more formal design if you're going for like a succulent like kind of feel. Um, I don't think it supports monarchs, but it supports tarantula hawks, which are really cool. They're like the, the largest wasp in the world. And so if you have a little like succulent bed, um, definitely pick up a desert milkweed. It's it's. Um, yeah, Asclepia subulata. And there's there's one that I, we want to get into cultivation. I, I, you don't really see it out there as Asclepias albicans, which grows in the Sonoran Desert. And it's basically like a, a subulata that's like twice as high. So just picture this, picture like a desert kind of succulent stemmed plant without any leaves. It's photo, photosynthetic stems that's like four to five feet tall. And it's a milkweed and it brings these like crazy wasps that are about this big which may sound horrifying but they're all they're beautiful they're beautiful yeah um they do i have heard they have like the worst sting imaginable oh. don't, don't get stung by them just don't get yeah. stung but i think exactly. they very rarely sting is what i've been told um but they're super interesting and and they will come to really urban gardens like we've seen them in gardens in the middle of the city somehow they find these desert milkweeds and and if you plant them it brings those insects in yeah. All right. Let's throw out like a few more plants to companion plant with milkweed, just to just to get people excited about them. I'm gonna throw it on. Oh, if you got room for a tree, you get a desert willow in there. Those are yeah. pretty easy to grow. They're you know low water needs, but they don't mind the extra water, so they're pretty forgiving. Yep. Um, we we haven't gotten to buckwheats. Oh yeah. Summer flowering, like um, so we have a little monarch sanctuary kit at Theodore Payne. Like a little plug here. It's it's a seed kit that you can grow. Um, you can basically grow 50, 50 plugs out of it, and it's it's called the Monarch Sanctuary Kit. It's on our on our online store. But we one of the plants in that is red buckwheat, um, Iriaginum grande rubescens, which is a classic native plant. 
killer summer blooms super pretty another one that kind of moves around and travels and is a little uh you know a bit of a wander which is great for this i think this kind of like palette that we're putting together here i would get some yeah. sage in there too don't don't want to leave our sages out oh for sure definitely some I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go over these topics real quick just so we've covered just a few ideas that we wanted to and yeah. then maybe Izzy, if you could throw out uh, one or two topics that people might be uh, asking. So when you guys install milkweeds, when you buy them, ideally let's plant them in groups. Let's let's create a target for your monarchs, right? So three, five, seven, um, and not too expensive. You can buy the seed, right? If you can buy the seed for five dollars, you can get them grown um, on your own. It's not too bad. Um, they tend to like wetter areas. So if you have a decomposed or a DG gravel front yard. In Pasadena, that's getting blaring sun, wide open, probably not the best spot unless you find an area where the water accumulates after you irrigate or after it rains, right? Usually the places where, you, where weeds come up. I like to treat them the opposite of bulbs. Our native bulbs, um, a lot of times they go dormant during the summer. We don't water them during the summer. So we leave a space open. So we do the opposite with the bulbs. Um, can, can you guys take over real quick? Somebody's vacuuming out here. The, the glory, the glories of live TV. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm. I totally agree with what Antonio just said. That they are like. I've never thought about this, but it, it's a good way to put it. They are kind of like the opposite of bulbs in that there's a there's like a small subset of California native plants that are summer growing. So you've got yeah. um, milkweed is a, is one of the big ones, and then the other like the, a lot of the desert grasses. Yeah, I mean, yeah, a lot of desert natives um, that are perennial because in the desert, they're getting a little bit more summer rain than we tend to get here on the cis montane side of things. Totally. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of cool, too, like, is that a, a, like a lot of people think like, OK, it's, it's a native plant garden. I don't really do any planting in the summer. You can actually plant a lot of things in the summer. Um, and if you're looking at looking at it from those desert plants, some of the more riparian plants. Yeah, riparian plants. You just have to be strategic and avoid like the hot, like those heat waves. Just yeah. like dodge the heat waves, look for those little cooler windows and aim for those like, just like you're saying, the desert plants, the riparian plants. Yep. You can garden so, um, 365 with native. Yeah. Um, a few people were asking in the Q&A and the chat, if your businesses um, do at-site consultations or if you have any recommendations for any other places that do and kind of how to know, you know, specifically for other people's uh, yards, what to do. Yeah, totally. So um, I, I definitely offer consultations in the Northeast Los Angeles area, I try to keep it fairly local. Um, I don't know, Evan, do you guys do consultations as well? We, if you come to the nursery with like pictures, well, we're happy to kind of try to troubleshoot stuff, but we don't do site visits. Um, but there, we do maintain a list of um, native plant landscapers that, that you can find um, on our website. And, and if you come to the nursery, we'll, depending on where you are, we have, we've got people kind of all over SoCal, but if you're in Northeast LA, Nicole Calhoun, Artemisia Nursery, that's who you're gonna wanna, gonna wanna hire, I think. I wanna make a plug, cause I used to work at Theodore Payne I love Theodore Payne. You guys have amazing classes. So sometimes you guys offer design classes mm -hmm. where yeah. folks feel like it. And if they have the cash, they can take their own design class. And I've sat in on those classes. They're intense. They're really, really good. Um, and you're, you guys just started up a landscaper training program. Yeah. Not necessarily design, but it's a bilingual Spanish-English uh, training program, which I think is going to start producing some even more better trained landscapers, right? So how do they find out about that, Evan? Yeah, so um, our website, theodorepain.org, um, has got lots of information on it. Uh, Izzy just put it in the chat, so check us out there. And then our Instagram is uh, at Theodore Payne, our Facebook is at Theodore Payne. And our Eventbrite, which has all of our classes, you can just search uh, Theodore Payne and Eventbrite. We do about 60 classes a year. And Antonio mentioned the design one, that's a great one. You work with a professional landscape architect and they basically take you take, you know, aerial footage or aerial imagery of your your garden and then they work through like what are you what are your goals? What are you trying to achieve? It's a three part uh, class and so that one's really cool. And then yeah, the landscaper training that we've just kicked off is more industry facing, which has been pretty uh, pretty great to see. 
And um, that's something that the industry just really needs is, uh, is folks. I hear, I see some names, Brenda and Emerson from TPF. Those, yeah, they're, they're awesome. Um, uh, and the landscaper training is so crucial because you can have the best intentions with your design and you might even successfully install those plants, but if you're not maintaining them correctly or if you have a gardener who's not maintaining them correctly, the design goes right out the window. So being able to kind of see it all the way through from the inception to the install and then maintaining that garden over the years is really, really important. So that's awesome that you guys are offering those those classes. Yeah, yeah. And actually there, it's a really good deal because the class classes are free right now. We have funding from the Department of Water and Power who, and they've very uh, generously made this free to people who want to take it. You have to be a professional um, to have like a business it's not for homeowners now, although we may make it available. And it's it's an eight part class. It's about 18 hours total. It covers all facets of kind of native plant gardening and maintaining. And I, you know, we're, our our hope is to get to get a, a really skilled, trained workforce that can maintain native plant gardens, so we can see much more of them um, be out there. And if we do that, we'll save a lot of water, and we'll also support the monarch butterfly and many other. Uh, organisms so it's sort of a win-win for the environment we can rebuild rebuild our biodiversity here in southern california and also save water at the same time and uh so it's yeah <laughs> we'd love to love to tell you more about it check us out theaterpain.org there's uh one or two questions not too much related with design uh someone asked about um using them in shade like under oak trees um and uh, working with succulents and milkweed. I think those are, those are two good topics. Um, maybe if uh, either of you, I know you had mentioned succulents and milkweed, um, Evan. Yeah, I think succulents um, could, could definitely work. Um, you know, succulents are, are like pretty, for certain ones can take summer water, Dudley is not so much, but depending on what kind of succulents you're talking about, if, if it's native succulents, um, you know, I mean, just look at where things grow. So you have, you have Dudleya and, and desert, um, desert milkweed, Asclepia subulata growing together in Baja and places like that. So if you're going to go, if you're going to go heavy succulents, I would use the desert milkweed, but you could probably do, um, narrow leaf. I actually have narrow leaf in my succulent bed and it's doing fine. I just spot water it occasionally. So I just bring a watering can and I'll, I'll water that. Um, but I, I actually feel like succulent gardens in some ways are more or like almost easier to water because you can summer water them and you like they need less water but they also can take it whenever um so yeah i think it i think it can work um it's just the the texture of narrow leaf milkweed it's called narrow leaf milkweed so it's kind of a little delicate and if you've got like big chunky agaves and things like that it might look a little weird but you can make anything work it's just about having the right, you know, getting in the right place in that placement so the textures work together. Yeah. Yeah, I think under oaks could be a little a little bit on the tricky side. Um, and I see somebody in the chat, Kim Young, uh, called out ribes as a good companion plant that can handle life under oaks. I know ribes arium is attractive to uh, monarchs. So if you have a big oak canopy, I would probably say, you know, try to find like something on the periphery of the shade, not deep in the canopy, and that could be your spot for your milkweed, but then maybe a little bit more under the canopy, you could be looking at things like ribes, um, maybe some of the more shade tolerant Arctostaphylus as well. Um, but yeah, that could be a little tricky to interface, I think the milkweed and the oaks. So I would try to get to the edge of the oak zone and see if you can find any spots around there. I agree with that, definitely. I, they kind of do like sun. Um, and putting them in deep shade is not gonna, probably not going to be too successful doing that. Yeah. Oh, I. Uh, for us? Yeah. Um, there's a. Uh, well, someone's asking for your contact, Nicole. If you could drop that in the chat, yeah. how to get a hold of you, and if you guys could just remind folks where you work and maybe any last closing remarks. Um, I'll, I'll go first. So I'm Evan from Theodore Payne Foundation. Um, my email is really easy. It's just evan at theodorepayne.org. Feel free to reach out. Um, a closing, couple closing things. One, 
is that I think of milkweed in a in this sort of mixed perennial garden as like sprinkles like you're sprinkling it in it's not going to be like dominant but just having them sort of sprinkled throughout can be really beautiful and you can have um, the monarchs and i also think i'm really glad that samo fund is putting this on it's super cool and antonio thanks for putting all this effort into this just like from a big conceptual place like i think of butterflies as actually part of the garden so like that's like you're designing like right now at Theodore Payne, we have so many butter, so many monarchs flying around. We have caterpillars, we have chrysalis. It's all happening right now. And it's just like, that is a design feature. Like having a whole bunch of like vibrant orange butterflies just dancing around is a design feature. So that's how you should be looking at your garden. And it goes way beyond monarchs. There's so many other species you can support. So it's really like a, a, a never ending quest to, to learn about all this stuff. But that idea of like this other layer of your garden, it's yes, it's beautiful. Yes. It's a nice place to hang out, but really what it is, it's habitat. And all those animals you see are part of your garden. It's part of the design and you've created your own little ecosystem. That's pretty, pretty amazing to be part of. So that's what I'll, that's what I'll leave with. And thanks for having me out here today. Yeah. Here, here, Evan, that's really well said. Um, my name is Nicole Calhoun. I work at Artemisia Nursery. Um, you guys can reach out to me anytime uh, through the nursery email. It's just artemisianursery at gmail.com. Um, I wholeheartedly agree with everything Evan just said. Um, wildlife is, that's why I garden. Um, I really want to say thanks to Antonio Sanchez and to the SAMO Fund for putting this whole event together. It's been awesome checking out the other speakers. You guys are a great crew. It's wonderful um, being part of a community that is uh, putting so much good work out there to try to support monarchs. And uh, they're basically an ambassador species, right? Like it's easy for us to call the monarch and do what we can to support them. And when we are supporting one species, we end up supporting so many others as well. So thank you guys for all the good work that you're doing. Nicole and Evan, before you guys go, so we are, we're in a band together. I'm not here to promote the band, but one time Evan, I just gotta tell you a story Evan. When you weren't around, I don't know if you were there, Nicole, but we were like, oh, Evan, we gotta get a nickname for him. Do you remember what his nickname was? <laughs> well, we, well, we call this nickname because we have the songs and then he adds amazing stuff on top. Do you remember? Rico, remember? Sprinkles. Sprinkles. <laughs> and, and here you are talking about butterflies being sprinkles. <laughs> All about uh, the sprinkles, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys yeah. so much. Big no, hug. You, you, yeah, everyone should also check out our Instagram at Native Sage Against the Machine, which Antonio runs it's it's pretty funny and um we just played a show last week at artemisia nursery which was such a blast so um yeah jump we're, i think we're, we've got a gig coming up and uh we got a couple things coming up this summer so follow us on instagram to to find out about those and and come come listen to us play music yeah thank you guys applause thank thanks, you guys Antonio. very much we'll talk to you thank soon you. all right thanks everybody we haven't had enough chance i don't think to even just promote ourselves, we've been doing a very bad job. And so who is putting this conference on is SAMO Fund. We work directly with the National Park Service here in the Santa Monica Mountains. Um, we get to run the nursery here on their property. We, we do a lot of things apart from plants. Um, but I'll encourage you guys, if you're interested in supporting this work, which is completely free today, um, to go to samofund.org. We'll put the slide up after this last speaker and support our work. We're trying to hire three part-time youth this summer. Uh, we call it Mission Milkweed. And we're trying to get over 2 million milkweed seed collected, which sounds like a lot, but it's actually a very small amount of pods. Um, if each pod has about 100 to 200 seed in it, um, it's actually not too much seed. And our goal is to start bulking it here at the nursery so we can give seed away so that we can grow um, plants and give plants away to community gardens, to restoration sites, to homeowners, etc. So um, there's the link in the chat right there. 